as long as we, sorry, as long as we were talking about registration, this is what the registration uh, portal should look like. And when you get the announcements of the Equitize sessions, um, that will be on your uh, invitation. And try to be consistent with your email, uh, the email that you use for signing. If you're using one and signing into Zoom, uh, be consistent because that really makes it so it's automatic for you to get your certificate. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So Tina. once you get an account, you'll only have to do that once. And then this is what will look like uh, where you want to log in and register. The login refers to the registration into the ESD service. Uh, the ESD uh, database. And then um, when you want certificates or when you want to know about events and things like that, you can go back to this account to find out um, where your certificates are and any information about what you've done in this system. I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, this is the startup slide and we always um, show it and what I realize is you all are used to um, seeing it so sometimes people aren't reading it anymore, but uh, the sessions, all our Equitize sessions are recorded and you can find them at this link and then also if you need additional accessibility options to the ones that we provide you can find those here. So those things um, are for real, and we hope you join us. Uh, good morning, we're Echo Ties, and my name is Gail Bowser. I am the host for Echo Ties sessions to, um, this year, and that's been really a treat. It's always fun to be back with you all. Um, I work as an independent consultant to RSOI, and basically I do whatever projects Deb asks me to do. So um, that's also a treat. Our coordinator is Deborah Fitzgibbon. She's coordinator for both RSOI and for the Oregon Technology Access Program. So you're probably uh, encountering her and working with her in all sorts of ways um, as we move forward in this school year. Uh, we have talked about the credit and how to register for that. Um, you will receive 1.25 hour, contact hours for every Equitize session. And we've looked at the registration process. So folks are getting used to that and uh, asking us to help them troubleshoot the new system. Please, if you run across any issues with the registration system or getting your credits or things like that, let us know because this is a brand new system. And sometimes we don't know until somebody actually tries to use it, but we want to work out all the bugs as soon as possible so that we're not frustrating people trying to get their credits. Uh, two quick announcements today. If you haven't already uh, signed up and you have an interest, the 2000, uh, 2021 virtual feeding seminar will be November 4th and 5th. It's not too late to sign up for that. And there are going to be some wonderful sessions. Uh, you can go to the RSOI website to take a look at what those sessions are and all the opportunities that are available to your feeding team. If you're not part of a feeding team, but you have an interest, you're welcome to join us also. Um, the next statewide town hall for OTs and PTs will be on November 8th. At between 1.30 and 3.30, Deborah Fitzgibbons and Aaron Bompiani uh, host those statewide town halls. And it's an opportunity to ask questions that uh, you may think you're the only person who has those questions, but I'm betting you're not. So uh, the Zoom link is here and we will put that in the chat box also. Um, but that's the Zoom link for the live session. There's no registration for the statewide town halls. So, um, and actually occasionally people have asked, are there, is there CEUs for the statewide town halls? And the answer to that is there are not because it's not a set uh, curriculum. We can't 
we never know what the topics of those meetings will be until people start. We have been able to give credit for focus groups, like at our conferences when it's a, 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 so, I mean, it's not out of the realm, but right now we are not. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, if you can, we'd love it if you would um, show your camera. We realize some of you are in places where that's not possible for a whole variety of reasons. But one of the benefits of Echo Ties is that we are getting to know each other in new ways. So um, I've got a couple of people that I always am thrilled when they join an Echo Ties session because I've learned to know them a little bit and, and value their company contributions. So if you can, un, uh, unlock your camera so we can see you, but if you can't, that's okay too. We wanted to tell you that we have a very special speaker next time. Erin Sheldon um, will be joining us. She is um, the mother of two daughters with disabilities. One of them has a very significant Angelman syndrome, a significant disability with, and uses augmentative communication and all kinds of accommodations. Her other daughter has uh, learning disabilities and ADHD. So she also works for uh, a vendor and um, she just, her range of experience is wonderful and we want to talk with her next time about parents as partners with therapists. So I, I wanna encourage you to attend this one if you can. Erin has some real interesting perspectives and especially now that her daughter is aged out of the school system, she's got the full range of points of view. But today- a session for us related to OGCOM and uh, Echo Voices. So she, Brittany, uh, if you're on, if you can put a link to that session uh, that she did for us for Echo Voices, that would be great. Thank you. So, uh, but today's speaker is actually our very own Deborah Fitzgibbons. Um, she's gonna talk about the PEEP, the Personal Emergency and Evacuation Plan that uh, we've been working on with the, the State Emergency Planning Group. Um, and Alex was supposed to be with us today, but ironically, he had an emergency, so he is not able to join us. So we're gonna invite Deb to uh, present about the PEEP, and we're hoping for a pretty good open discussion today because we wanna know uh, whether you've been using this document, how things are going, and what else needs to happen. So Deb, your turn. Thank you, Gail. And uh, first of all, anyone who knows me knows that I am supporting all of you who are wonderful therapists across our state, but I am not a therapist. So I'm not trying to present myself as an expert on the role that you play. What I am is a facilitator who has been listening uh, to common concerns and uh, soliciting your input on finding common solutions, ones that can resonate from each end of uh, the state and, and everywhere in between. And uh, so this is uh, about your role and you are certainly um, welcome to give your input at any and every point. And so having said that, uh, this is the PEEP, um, lovely known as the PEEP. It is the, it, you will see it uh, without the ampersand, but we really decided that is the personal emergency and evacuation plan because emergencies don't always include evacuation. So welcome to this session and uh, thank you for your voices. Uh, Alex, uh, again, was going to be here. Alex has been part of the uh, a statewide um, a grant that came from the federal government, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but Alex's team is charged with um, helping develop plans across our state. So I'm just going to go back a little bit to give you an idea on where this discussion has been and, and why we are where we are right now. And um, so it began whenever our uh, OI, orthopedic impaired impairment, our PLT, professional learning team, were full of acronyms in education. We know that, so I don't want to assume you know, but um, 
we started up again after a hiatus and we looked at commonalities of issues that we were facing and right away emergency planning came up as one of those areas that uh, everybody identified as a common concern. What are we going to do about it? Well, we start with the PLT and bringing those concerns uh, to the table. Well, the next thing that happened is our lovely Camille Robinson, who I see uh, joined us this morning, uh, we took it to a broader audience. And so in April of 2019, Camille led a focus group at our TIES conference. And basically it was what is going well, what are your challenges, and what is it, how is it you see that RSOI can support you in this way? And so what's going well? Well, people who are already doing the PEEP had some versions of the PEEP and everybody loved the acronym, first of all, so it kind of caught on. Uh, but some of the other things that were happening, we knew we had some best practices out there. And the emergency bag, some called it the Stop the Bleed Kit. Uh, and it's something that the student has with them at all times. And of course, including emergency. But so this is going to be a theme of uh, planning. Um, people that were doing things well were doing individualized training uh, for the students. And oftentimes we hear our uh, students, um, and maybe you're not hearing them, maybe this has changed, but I hear that the kids who have difficulty with the alarms and the sirens were not necessarily part of training. They kind of got a buy for that. And is that okay? Not when it comes down to the actual emergency, because I will have nothing in my memory bank. And so, you know, finding ways to work with that is going to be a skill that's going to help them throughout their lives. And so training is part of that. It's theme running through. Identifying the exits, practice drills. So these are some of the things that were actually happening. And Camille, if you can relive this experience and have anything to add to uh, the feel of the conference or comments, please jump in here. Okay, thank you. Camille's on our uh, PLT, our OI uh, professional learning team. So what are your challenges? Well, forever and ever, it will be training staff forever and ever. Um, the, there's question about the roles and responsibilities. I mean, who's really supposed to be doing it? Who identifies who actually needs one? And uh, you know, what about the kids with mobility and communication? And on top of that, what about kids with procedural difficulties? Who, if the emergency goes off and I have sensory issues or uh, communication or um, uh, I, I get loud, when I supp I'm supposed to be soft, those are all things that need to be considered. And the reunification site is important. And we'll talk about its importance um, as we go along, but adequate evacuation chairs was another thing that came out. And so uh, making sure, first of all, that we have plans, but then having the tools uh, to uh, carry out those plans is also an issue. So when we said, how can we support you? The very first thing on the list is why we're here today. They said, can we create a form similar to the PEEP? Well, was the PEEP the right one? We started pulling together some of the samples of things that we're using, people were using and to come up with the super PEEP that uh, takes everybody's input. So they also said video resources, uh, recommendations, um, and then it really needs to go to uh, more trainings um, for those with OI and other low incidence disabilities. We realize that this is the primary connection with you, but we know that the emergency doesn't stop there. We also know that many of our kids who have orthopedic difficulty have other, um, other conditions, um, other secondary uh, diagnosis. <laughs> So it really is about everybody. So at that time, we are thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to move this forward? Well, all of a sudden, I'm talking to someone and they say, well, did you know that the state just received a five-year grant uh, to help schools develop uh, emergency plans? And so on the phone with them, hey, can we partner? And the answer has been yes uh, from day one, which was why Alex was going to be here today. So I think this, uh, they have two more years left to this grant. Uh, so it is all about 
supporting the 197 districts to develop school plans. Now, some districts, as you can imagine, had some really well thought out good plans. Some had things that have been dusty, need to come out and get the cobwebs brushed off and updated. And then some had really next to nothing except for saying, we need to consider our kids with disabilities when we plan. And so um, all of the training is based on national guidelines. And when we consider that it's often the PT and or the OT through our discussion, that's who we've, we've kind of gathered that that's usually who leads the charge for the evacuation plan. It's best as a team approach. And we know that from every all of our discussions, bringing all of the uh, stakeholders together. And so their training is about community training with the schools and making sure that the, not just creating this plan, but getting it out there for the police and everybody who is engaged or has a role during an emergency. So they are using the school goals as their community goals and taking a shared interest in raising our kids together safely. So um, helping accommodate or accounting for and accommodating our students, accounting for uh, people uh, with other functional needs. And so when we talk about the training they've been doing, sometimes it says, and don't forget to consider people with disabilities. Okay. Some places it may go a little bit deeper, but some places that's kind of where it stops. And so as I have been thinking about this and talking to people, when I first mentioned this to Gail, she says, well, okay. And then as we go along, the ramifications and how big these considerations are start to come to you about all the things that you need to consider. So that's why we are here to consider those things. So uh, one of the documents, and uh, this is a link in your, um, in your PowerPoint. I want to be able to open it up, and I'm not sure I had it in my presentation slides, but I minimize those. Um, there is actually a sample of a plan that we have used, and this is something that was is part of the uh, training that they gave us when they came and did echo tie sessions. It's an accommodations plan that is good. We've taken that as part of our template and again, put it on steroids. So this is one that you'll want to take a look at. I'm giving you some links so you can uh, see for yourself in your discussions. As part of our plan, we wanted to bring additional information. And so in 2020, we brought a mom. Who better than a mom uh, to be the advocate for uh, planning? And her daughter was in a building uh, that had two or more floors, uh, her daughter in a wheelchair. There was no plan on how she was going to get to the second floor, um, particularly if there was the elevator was out. And then there was also not enough equipment. Uh, there was not good equipment that everybody would have um, a med sled. So one of the things that, and so I've got a link to her uh, presentation and the recording, but one of the things that came out of that that was an aha thing for me is they have added in their IEP, does this student require accommodations in an emergency situation? And then it has another step and a point where you can put that in there. Now, our IEPs don't have that right now, but this has really become the star uh, on the, or the, at the top of the ladder uh, that we're climbing is to have that so that everyone really does need to uh, consider this as part of the IEP. We know that everyone needs to have a plan if they have a difficulty, um, but particularly our kids um, who are going to struggle. One of the documents, and again, we can put this link in, you will have this in your handouts. I'm wondering, can I? It, I'm limited on being able to copy the link and paste it in the chat, but you will have this. This is another wonderful document that will give you food for thought. It's a teacher's guide. It's one that um, Lori Scott from Maryland, it's that mom I was just talking about. It's one that she brought to the table. It's got some great pieces that you want, might want to look at. We're not going to get particular today about how to get somebody in a wheelchair out of a building, but we obviously know that those are considerations that have to come into the plans 
We can schedule uh, additional trainings down the line if this is a topic that we want to focus on, but this is a good guide that has some of those ideas in it. So at that time, uh, again, that uh, the miraculous appearance of a grant that was going to help us get our uh, document out there as a template for people to use, uh, the partnership with uh, a, uh, some folks here in uh, Southern Oregon uh, came into play. They wanted us to help in adding some resources for persons with disabilities. And so Gail and I jumped on that, um, but also um, the gentleman here who was a trainer who came and sat in my office was Terry Plotz from this area, but the person that sat with him was Tennille Weatherall. And I don't know if you've seen Tennille's name lately, but she's now our state assistant superintendent of, um, and, and is over, she is there in a position uh, to help us to make sure that this is part of our plans going forward. So I believe we have the support um, from as far up as we can go with our with the need. So really, it's it's really talking about it's a training that comes through re, uh, readiness and emergency management for schools. Uh, that's what it's based on. I've given you a link to the slides that they use for their training for you to take a look at. But really, when we think about okay, how what does this encompass? It's not just when that alarm goes off what we do. We know that there are events that happen before, during and after. And so we have incorporated that into the PEEP to set, have pre, during, and after planning. The um, mitigation, um, and I have definitions for these in the slides, uh, but the prevention, of course, doing whatever you can to keep from escalating. Mitigation, again, to keep it um, the uh, reduction in, in the risk, um, protecting those who are involved, responding, and quickly. When we talk about a scenario, it's boom, boom, boom. And, and what are we going to do? The importance of having that thought out is crucial. So when I say that, they in their slideshows, you're going to see a scenario that they present. And just to get us in that frame, okay, what does it look like? 10.05 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. It's at school's in session, 40 degrees outside, overcast, light breeze. What happens? Well, nearby, a tanker truck carrying hazardous materials crashed into another vehicle. It's on a, just a few blocks away. It's leaking yellowish gas, yellowish gas that's hovering close to the ground. Motors calls it in. The media begins to report it. This is within just eight minutes. This is what's happening. Family members hear it. They're starting to call the school. This is the first the schools heard about it. They didn't even know. So the principal calls the dispatch and gets the information. This is within 10 minutes. The crash is verified, but they still don't know how they're going to respond. In 12 minutes now, the principal's getting the school incident response team. They are getting things in place. They are making decisions. 13 minutes, the principal uses the intercom, shelter in place, seal up your rooms. Custodian knows how to turn off the HVAC. Woohoo! Thankfully, he's there today. Um, two other member staffs were cross-trained. They're all working on keeping and mitigating, minimizing, and protecting. As the windows are being sealed, the teacher noticed out on a field with their teachers seemingly unaware. It looks like some students might be coughing. They're out on the field. They're doing some activities. Oh my, are any of those kids in a wheelchair? Are any of them using OGCOM devices? Are your students out there? In the office, phones are ringing. I mean, all these things are happening. Uh, people trying to get the inhalers and medications to their students all within 20 minutes. Something has to be done. What's going to happen outside? Have they been contaminated? Now, we don't have the answers to what happened there, but you can imagine in this scenario that if you don't have a well thought out plan and somebody's looking out their window and little Shannon is on the field and she's coughing and she's got to, um, you, you, you don't have to, you live it in the fear. Whenever we went to virtual and you weren't able to see your students, every one of you had in your mind, I know what this kid is going through. I know what their home life is. I know, And so your passion is there. You know how important this is. I don't have to tell you. But at that point, we took a look um, and 
they asked us, could we put together some slides that would be a supplement? And so we did. And so Bruce um, Alter, who's on with us, gave us a bit of input and then Gail and I. And so we really wanted to keep it in the same framework as the um, as the training that was already been given for those emergency uh, folks. And so we used the pre, the during, and the, the, um, the after. We, we framed things in that way. So the link that you will have here is the link to the full slide deck that we uh, shared with them. And I've pulled out some excerpts from that to talk about uh, in preparation. So one of the things, um, and this is a, a FEMA video on planning, I'm just going to go ahead and share a little bit of it up with you, but you have a link to it as well. It's a uh, YouTube video, and I'm just going to uh, go ahead and um, see if I am optimized. Is it my audio settings that I need to optimize? I think so. There's a checkbox that when you go, uh, I think Is when you try to share off? the video, it'll ask you if you Is want to optimize. To be there okay. If okay. you've already done it, you may not need to do it again. You'll see. So it's under the sharing. Are you able to hear it? No. Every individual can take a oh. Could you now? To prepare for a little bit. What? Do I need to turn it up or? Okay. Is it under my sharing? Yeah, you're going to have to back up, stop sharing, and then click the use computer sound when you share again. Optimize for a video clip. Well, if you have a disability or other perfect. access or functional need, you may have to take additional steps to protect yourself and your family. People with disabilities and uh, people who have access and functional needs have to take a very proactive uh, position in their personal preparedness. If you think about it, we do it every day. We're ready for the next little disaster that we will face every day. I always say prepare as if no one's coming to rescue you um, because the reality is in a moderate or large event, no one is coming to rescue you anytime soon. It may be a very short period of time, it may be a more extended period of time, but you need to prepare as if you're not going to have any of the resources that you might typically depend on. The best way people can start to plan is by looking at the individual part of their daily lives and figuring out where the potential gaps are. Do an inventory of yourself, do an inventory of the things that you use on a daily basis um, to be living independently, and then think about what is essential. Think about the strategies, services, devices, tools and techniques you use to live with a disability on a daily basis. These may include medications, durable medical equipment, service animals, assistive technology, communication tools, and transportation. You really have to be focused as to what are your needs if you end up going to a shelter for four or five days, or if you're stuck in sheltering a place because people just can't get to you. What are the essential things that you're gonna need um, to be able to survive? As you think about assembling a support team, you need to be thinking about who are the people in your workplace, who are the people in your neighborhood, who are the people in your community, who might be able to assist you. Go over your emergency plan with everyone in your support network. Make sure that someone in your personal support network has an extra key to your home and knows where you keep your emergency supplies and teach them how to use any life-saving equipment. Okay, so I'm going to stop because it's really, uh, you know, it's talking about adults, uh, which is certainly relevant, but from the perspective of everyday you, every minute you have to be prepared for an emergency whenever you used to have such challenges of navigating, uh, communicating, and uh, just being able to survive uh, whenever you don't always have control of all of the pieces and parts of your life. Uh, whenever he, it, it chokes me up when he says, uh, prepare as if nobody's going to rescue you. It makes me think of what Lori Scott, gave, the, the details she gave us about the World Trade Center and how many folks with disabilities were placed in the stairwells and said, wait right here.
here, the emergency folks are going to come and get you. And we all know how that, uh, how that turned out. And so uh, this is, again, I don't have to tell you about the why. You all know the why. And um, let's see, I got to get back to where I was. Don't worry. There. But this is a resource that you can use if you are talking to others, because it does have the voice of individuals um, that, um, that are so necessary here. So um, for, with those perspectives, what we did was looking at what are the categories of for folks um, are you seeing what you need to see here, Gail? Or is this no, our... Deb, um, you might have to back out and share again. Um, you're... Am I sharing too many screens here? Uh, yeah, the, I, it's very blurry and not readable, and it used to be just fine, so. How about this? Uh, yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for... That's why we pay you the big bucks, Gail. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. We, you have, here's what Gail gets paid. The eternal gratitude of, <laughs> of the kids of Oregon. Thank you, Gail. Uh -huh. So what we wanted to do in, in helping folks to think outside of the box, those particularly who've never worked with anybody uh, that are the ones that you work with every single day, uh, helping and giving a bit of a scenario. Uh, so we added, uh, here's some things that you might consider for somebody with disabilities. So at this school, we added that in addition to her, she's dwarfism, short st uh, stature, has a congenital heart deformity. Um, she's had, during a recent drill, they realized that she moves so much slower and gets winded. And she is one of the students on that coughing, uh, coughing out on that field. Deb, I'm sorry, but your screen got blurry again. I don't know what's different. Um, yeah, stop sharing and let's, D don't optimize it for video this time. Don't know what's going on. It was working beautifully. Whoop. Just making sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Good call, Gail. Is that it? We That's did. good now. Okay, well, excellent. We'll That's what it is then. I can, it, you click the one for sound, but not the one to optimize. Okay, so we've got Susie out on the field and she's out there and she's coughing. The teacher was so concerned that she recruited a, class, a classmate. Aha, part of Susie's um, a survival plan is going to be making sure that there's someone who knows that Susie needs to be picked up and carried uh, to the class's safe location. So they've identified in advance an able-bodied football player to pick her up, and that's part of her plan. They are going to uh, put together a peep in order to make sure that she's prepared for this situation. How will you develop a personalized plan for this student? If we have someone with uh, procedural challenges, Eric here, uh, and Eric we're going to use as a bit of a case study in a moment when we look at the PEEP, but he attends a self-contained class. Uh, he's got severe emotional disturbance, uh, schizophrenia, uh, takes medication, has hallucinations, history of violent outbreaks not, that weren't manageable. Five students in his class, student ratio one-to-one. -one. Eric experiences meltdowns in unplanned situations. May take two staff members to keep him calm um, from hurting others. Do you know somebody like Eric? They had determined that he's not gonna participate because in the drills because it, it's not good for him or the other kids. He's uh, alone with the, the teachers alone with five students when the shooting begins. What's going to happen? Well, this is this may sound like a far out thing, but this is something that is not made up. The self-contained classroom is across the hall from the classroom the shooter enters. The, the gunshot reminds him of a fun game he and his cousin play together. He begins laughing uncontrollably and very loud. He has no concept of the danger and has never practiced this scenario. It was short lived and he was not only making only one, not the only one making a loud noise. But what I have heard is that there are those who have decided to put the ones making the noise in the hallway uh, so that they will be the, uh, the, the, the shooter will not enter the classroom that they will see the loud person in the hallway first. Now, I hate to say that, but that was the reasoning and that's what a school 
actually did. How will you develop a plan for that student? Or how about the one with communication challenges? This person who um, isn't, uh, whenever she has the intellectual and communication disorder, which I know you can all relate to, um, she, they do practice drills so that uh, they can understand and are prepared when the drills happen. She has a device, it's always with her. They have added an emergency checklist to help her remember what to do. They've got some really good things going, pre-recorded messages from family, so that those are some of the things that can help in, in calming her down. She's one of the missing students that uh, from a, a, an emergency. She doesn't have her device. It's being repaired today. Without a device, she doesn't have her checklist or her voice. She and a classmate hover in the corner of the room until somebody comes for them. So again, I don't have to tell you that these are scenarios that we're talking about, but how will you develop the plan for that student? Well, in our true uh, fashion, we brought someone in who's really an expert in this area. Um, she did a session for us and you will have a link to that recording. She came in 2020 um, and uh, from the University of Colorado in giving some really good tips and considerations for those who work with kids um, with communication difficulties in emergencies. So what we look at, and, and when we look at the best practices, the pre-event planning activities are the P's, the two P's, creating a plan that considers the scenarios, considers where that student is going to be at different parts of the day, considers, plans it, and practices, not just have a plan that's stuck in a student's file, making it known, distributing it, and practicing it. There has to be something for students to be able to work through before that novel situation. So make a plan uh, and plan to disseminate it to team members and community stakeholders. I asked Alex um, as he was planning to come today, I said, do you have a map that is color coded perhaps that shows where this training has happened or where the folks are really focused on this? And he does not. And so I suggested that uh, it would be helpful for us because we need to know um, when people are in these conversations, how to put ourselves in them. But we also know that you on the front lines with the kids are, and I don't mean it to sound like a battle, but it could be on the, any given day. You who are working with your students, you know that you have to do something whether there's anything going on in the community or not. And so working with the student is the front, uh, front of your mind, um, but also um, beyond that, um, be forcing the issue and asking your administrators, hey, did you know that there's a training? Hey, should we be part of this training? And so as often happens with therapists, pulling it down rather than waiting for somebody to push it down. So make a noise. So, um, and this is, uh, again, taking together all of those ones, all of the documents and putting them together and putting them out with a little stakeholder input. And we've made updates based on some things, particularly that uh, some folks in um, uh, the, around Portland and, and Clackamas, some of the information that they shared. And so I'm going to um, open this document uh, and take a look at that, but this is a sample. Now this sample is also part of what they are using on the training basis. And so remember when I said that our goal is really to get something as a special factor in the IEP, this is a document that it, and the, the IEP will be opened up within the next couple of years. It's kind of gotten moved out a little bit because of other priorities. But when they open that up and when we are able to add, does a student require then we will have something that has been vetted and has input that we can say ODE, here is something that we can add um, as a reference uh, when people are starting to plan. So that's really the big goal. So um, moving to the next screen. So um, it's the personal emergency evacuation plan. And so the question that people had about who needs a plan, that's where we started, okay? We started with, looking at the information, but if you look at those first questions after the student demographics, you're going to see, is this student able to navigate the facilities? Follow procedures. 
is the second question. Carol, I see you're leaning up towards your screen. Is it uh, is it that we need to make ours bigger or do we? You okay? <laughs> you're just coming in for the details. Okay. And Deb, uh, Brittany's been doing a marvelous job of putting all the links in the chat box. So if you uh, if people want to, she just put the the link to this document in the chat if you want to open it up on for yourself. I will as soon as I come to no, talk about I, Brittany, a particular student. Thank you, Brittany, Brittany. Has already done it, so it's it's there for people to look at if they want. Okay, excellent. And so the slides should be in that file, and that document is there as well. And the most recent copy of the document um, is from May. We made changes in May of this year, so if you see anything other than May, you got an old version. Right. So in looking at this, um, again, is the student able to communicate effectively? These are the three points that if you say, um, is they, are they able to not know, I'm not able to navigate? Well, you can stop right there because this student needs a plan. If you say yes to all of those, this student really doesn't need a plan. Now, if there's medication or something, I mean, that's a little bit different that you have to have a plan to know where am I going to get my medication. But when we're talking about a real plan, mobility, uh, procedural, and communication. If you have students who have difficulties, that's who need a plan, who needs a plan. And so if you answered no, uh, then moving forward to complete the survey. So then, uh, as we talked about, we need to talk about the pre, the pre-plan. What happens before? Well, developing a plan, adding it to the IEP or 504, making sure that we're sharing it. And again, we put in dates. Now, you're going to see that this document is really a Word doc. It's not, uh, it's not locked. I mean, as we make additions or changes to it, we can do something that is more of a fillable PDF form to, for, for folks, but we wanted it, you to have it so that you can make changes. This is a template, but in your district, you may want, or with your student, you may say, I don't need that. So making sure that it's shared, training the team and putting together that go bag. Remember, we have a go bag that if my student in an emergency, they need fidgets, or they need a picture of mom or mom's voice, then those are the things that always need to be with that individual. And what always needs to be there? Well, you know, a copy of the emergency plan is good and any contact medical information. So those are some of the pre-activities and what else? Plan and practice, practice, practice. So take an inventory. What is it that they need? And so you heard that gentleman talking about what are the most important things to me? Well, looking at a flashlight, uh, batteries, you know, depending on where you are for you, uh, maybe some of these things are already in the environment. But if I know that my student has uh, dietary needs and it could be that we are going to be gone for a bit, what is in there? Is there a backup copy, printed copy of the communication pages for this student? That's going to be needed if it comes to a day uh, whenever it's being the device is being repaired and the emergency didn't wait for the repairs to be made. So a change of clothes. What are these things? Needs to be in a go bag. I'm going to ask you, show of hands, or you can type in the chat box. How many of you have students who have a detailed emergency evacuation plan? I think there's probably many of you who do. Okay. So mixed reviews, some of you have that, some of you know that you need to be planning. How many of you have students that whether or not they have a real solid plan, um, have a go bag? Okay, excellent. Maybe some of us need to prepare a go bag for ourselves. What's gonna be in that? Hmm. So, um, considerations in the emergency response. And so this is the next section of the PEEP. And again, we're going to look at that. But for communication, what is not just for that student who has communication difficulty, but how are you going to communicate with folks in the emergency? Uh, you know, what is it, how you're going to, is it visual? Is it a, a device? 
making sure that the information is here. When we look at the document, you're going to see that it is three pages. And so we're also going to say, what is it that somebody needs to see in an emergency when they don't have time to sit down and read three pages? Well, hopefully somebody's reviewing those ahead of time when we give those to the emergency response folks. But in reality, is that going to happen? So there's some things that are really going to need to jump out. So this is considering all the scenarios. If there's an extended power outage, do I have somebody who's going to have a problem because of, of medical device? We added pandemic on the bottom here, not because the pandemic excel, itself is the emergency, although it has become that, obviously. But what happens whenever the student is no longer able to uh, get what they have at school? Is there something that needs to be, go home that they have been using at school? Just considerations. So practice, 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 can't say that enough. Um, reunification, this is the point. And, and so there's someone in, our, uh, in my building who works with um, disaster, uh, Coast Guard. Uh, he said for almost everyone in these situations, the reunification plan is the piece that gets dropped. They don't consider, necessarily consider that whenever, uh, first of all, if I come out of a building and I'm in a wheelchair and you've put, put the bus over there for everybody to get on, that's on the other side of the muddy football field, huh, what are we gonna do there? But also thinking of what are we gonna do when we get someplace? Is there, um, is there someone who's going to need to be handy for telling social stories or is there a recording or you know, a, it, all of those things that come after when you've been working with somebody who's gone through what is equivalent of a trauma. <laughs> They've just experienced a trauma in what could have been 15 minutes time. Now, how are we going to pull it all back together for this student and all of the students on our, on our in our charge? So point of the family reunification. It, did, did you talk to the family? Well, you sure should have had them at the team meeting and come up with plan B. What are the supports that are needed? Again, social stories. Is it going to be need some counseling coming in? And if nothing more than having a discussion about these and say, okay, well, we've got this covered. These are the things that you don't think about until you're in the middle of the emergency if you don't have a plan. And then, of course, what is the distribution list? Who, need, who else needs to be on here? For those of you who've created a plan, who do you share it with? The principal? the classroom teacher, parents? Is there anybody else that you would put on here? And notice the last one is I'm putting a copy in the go bag. Is there anybody we're missing here that you think in an emergency, they really need to be able to pull this out? Well, you know, I've actually thought about, well, what format do they have it in, in the office? How quick is it going to be able, do they have it digitally so that somebody has it on their device? So if something happens, I can pull it up and go, okay, Johnny is in room 12B. Uh, go, go get, I mean, is it consolidated like that? I mean, that's another consideration. What is the administrator who has all of this information doing? Or is it coming back to, you're the one who knows. So just planning as a team and including the team in the process. So. Whenever and when we look at this, this is um, these are the slides that we have shared that are now part of the state training. So people are hearing the word PEEP. We're getting it out there. Some people have used it a little bit, but in their training, they do. And again, using their terminology, they do what they call tabletop exercises. And so what we're going to do is to choose one of the scenarios and we're going to pick Eric. And so I'm just going to go back up what to. Eric, and we're going to talk about Eric for a moment. And you will, may remember that when everything is quiet, Eric is the one who uh, can't be because um, he has never been part of the training. Um, um, there are a couple comments in the chat that um, before we get started on the case study might be um, good to address, would that be? Oh, absolutely. I was going to take a break right here. So Gail, you know, again, you're a mind reader. Um, so <laughs> okay. so why don't we go ahead and, and bring the, go ahead and mention those, Gail, and bring them out. All right. So Devin, do you mind unmuting yourself and talking about, you've got a couple comments in here um, about equipment. Sure. 
Thanks. Back when we were talking about pre-activities, um, if the equipment for facilitating the evacuation is not at the school, um, if it needs to be purchased, like an evacuation chair to get down the stairs or something like that, um, maybe an extra wheelchair that's kept in the office or in the health room that gets brought out to assist somebody with mobility needs to get, you know, from the bottom of the stairs out to the playground. Um, that needs to be pre-planned and the equipment brought to the school or purchased. And, Absolutely. and then listed, where is it stored? You don't want somebody to say, okay, well, there's one here at the school for them. Didn't anybody bother to write down where we're going to find it? <laughs> so you're right. Yeah. Absolutely. I had a student that had a power wheelchair. And if you say, oh, we transferred him into the evacuation chair, got him to the bottom of the stairs. Um, but then there's a second person in a power wheelchair upstairs that we need to go back up and get. Um, how does that person then get out of the building? That first person that's at the bottom of the stairs, they need to transfer into a manual chair so they can continue to leave the building um, while the staff go back and help the second person. It may be a second person that just has crutches and you say, oh, well, let's take that one down and give him his crutches back and he can leave the building. So it's a priority of who goes first type thing. Oh, terrible um, decisions to have to make in an emergency and in 15 minutes time. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, Devin, I think you do raise an interesting question, which is we have treat these uh, peeps as kids in isolation, but you're right when there are, you know, five kids in a classroom who all need different kinds of um, treatment during an emergency, that, that's a topic that, um, as I think about it, we might want to explore a little further. And I, that was one of the first questions I asked of uh, Jeremy Wells at the time, and now Alex is, is this just for training? And yes, it's only training. Uh, there's no purchase, there's no money for equipment. And I want to bring out that um, in Maryland, uh, Lori Scott, the parent who was advocating, obviously Maryland is much smaller. We have 197 districts and they don't. And, um, but they uh, actually wrote for, oh, no, they got private donations for funding and they put uh, at least one med sled in uh, every building that had two or more floors. And so, I mean, I think that there's ways we could we could look for funding for that if that was a direction we wanted to go. But right now, the responsibility of the equipment falls to the district. And so it needs to be included in their budgeting and planning. And something else I wanna say is that mostly we're thinking people don't have this, that you know, a lot of old buildings, small buildings that were not meant to be uh, uh, accessible. They were not designed with accessible features in the beginning. But I, I also know that Bruce, uh, who's on, uh, it, uh, has told me that there's some building and, and things going on in, in their area where they have really heavily considered um, uh, the needs for evacuation. And, and it's just a difference. So Bruce, can you say something about that? Do you know what I'm referring to? You mean the open layout of the new buildings? Yes. Yeah. Isn't it more so, conducive to rescue? Isn't sorry, say that again. Isn't it more conducive to rescue plans in in the way so, that they have, or is it the building itself? What I'll suggest to the group, if at all possible, um, the the fire marshal or deputy fire marshal has to do building inspections of the school on a regular basis and. I've been able to connect with them and go on some of those inspections. And it's, it's really eye-opening because they'll tell you a bunch of stuff you didn't know. One of the things that I've seen in our newer buildings is they have really open layouts. And I was concerned about that because previously we would look for areas of the building where smoke wouldn't pool if a student was going to stay on a second level. And that isn't the case in the new construction anymore. What I've what I've learned is that with modern materials, they said in the lat there was a change in code maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago with modern materials and sprinklers, smoke is not smoke and flame are not as much of the issue as they have been. Um, 
what what I do want to say is some of my buildings have been designed so there is no second level that there's a place they've cited the building so it's possible to get out of the, what is the second floor directly which is nice but a lot of what I learned early in my career isn't true anymore there aren't fire doors in a lot of the newer buildings and I don't know if that's what you wanted me to go on. I've been trying to get evac equipment. Last year, the district was kind of a wash in money, and I was able to get some lifter systems put in. But I, I've gotten price quotes for evac track and other equipment, and it's a uh, that's my next project after things if things calm down from COVID. Well, thank you, Bruce. And that's what I want to say is some things are really starting to change, and there is a mindset there. But even when people are aware of the difficulties, I'm reminded I've been tra attending a lot of trainings on this around the state and outside of what they are training on. And, and there was a gentleman who in, is in a wheelchair himself, uh, comes up to an emergency to what is determined as the reunification site. He's going in and people are, first of all, he couldn't park because he's people in emergency started parking everywhere uh, here and there. And so he couldn't get to the building and he's now you know, in his wheelchair and somebody's in the spot. He goes in and they say, oh, we're so proud. We have a spot where people with wheelchairs can take a shower. Okay, it goes to show them there is a bar down the middle of it. So yes, they could shower, but they can't get to the shower. And so just all of these things that people with good intentions, but unless you walk through and you look at those scenarios as Bruce is talking about, you can't imagine what the what it's going to be. So again, <laughs> consider everything. Devin, you got your hand up again, or still? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Just thinking of another thing, um... I pose the possibility of somebody with crutches. Um, those usually are, um, at least in high schools, um, temporary things. A student may have twisted their ankle and they come to school on crutches. Um, don't know if they can or can't manage the stairs, but they aren't necessarily on an IEP and wouldn't necessarily be in this group of people that we are planning for a PEEP and things like that, but it needs to be in the total building plan to say, oh, you know, we may have three students, uh, especially in high schools when you have, you know, 2000 kids, um, there's a good likelihood that you might have multiple students um, with a temporary crutches or a temporary wheelchair um, and having to get out of the building. The other concern that I have in thinking about um, how individuals are going to get down the stairs is how you're going to transfer the person from their wheelchair, if it may be that that's their you know, power wheelchair to get around to the evacuation chair or the med sled, or you know, if that's on the floor, can this person get from their wheelchair down to the floor? Does that take one person or two persons, or would it take um, more than that? Um, and how do they get secured in that so that they aren't injured as they go down the stairs? Um, so other considerations as well. Is that something that they can utilize because uh, they have contractures and can't really get down on the floor? So obviously we hear how much there is to consider. Um, it, depending on the student assistance, um, you know, the, the assistant plan and how they fit into it. Again, going back to training to if you got a plan, make sure everybody knows it. Um, assigning assistance uh, and Devin said, well, maybe the custodian could do something. And particularly if you're looking at those relationships that people naturally, you know, we talked about someone uh, being picked up by the football player. Uh, you know, you can look at some of those natural when you're looking at a student, well, who are your natural supports? And it makes sense that that person who's always looking out for you is going to keep doing that in an emergency. And so we've heard some uh, horror stories and we could put together a, a video of uh, bad answers uh, to and solutions to these. And Christine, I see that you have your hand up and I'm sorry that uh, I didn't see it earlier. Uh, can you unmute and tell us what's going on in your mind? Uh, sure, <clears throat> and I think this just, it's probably like on everybody's mind, but um, our district has emergency evacuation chairs that we got um, talk them into getting back when um, Deborah started talking about this at the ties conference a couple years ago. And, um, you know, so yay, we have these chairs. <clears throat> They're not intuitive. 
you really need to practice with them. Um, and, you know, it's the end of October and we're still training people because it takes a long time to get every, all the staff people involved. So I guess the main thing on my heart is that we get this equipment and here the PTs and OTs, we're thinking of these kids because this is our life. But um, who is, I think the main question really is when you're developing, who's responsible in the district for really getting the team together? Because it feels like a lot when you're the PT who knows the kids got mobility needs and you're the really the only one who knows how to open the chair. So uh, anyway, just putting that out there, I think everybody knows that that's an issue, um, but that's where I feel like our um, district, our districts really need to have a point person that has this on their mind besides just, you know, the it is a lot of weight for you to carry and it's a lot. And even whenever the administrators, here, they still don't know what you know about the intricacies of getting this student uh, through the building on a normal day, much less when everything is heightened. And so uh, the training piece, well, you know, I, I'm not going to say that we have the answers, to all, but if there is something that we could put together, maybe we need a session on uh, evacuation chairs and the ins and outs. Maybe we need to make sure that as we plan for our spring conference that we bring uh, vendors of evacuation chairs that could give it. Maybe we do videos of those and, and we, if we had a session, we record it so that it could be shared and people could watch it in their own time. I mean, there are solutions, um, but... Mm -hmm. uh, and it Go ahead. And I, I, I oh, love okay. the idea of having it on the IEP because I feel like at least the IEP team knows, but um, you know, how many teachers have kids in high school that do they all really read the IEP? And then does the principal ever read the IEP or the, well, and that's going to be a case of anything. In yeah. Our IEP. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And so Gail, I know you had something, but I also want to call on my friend Shannon up in the, uh, up in the corner. Well, she's in the corner on my screen, <laughs> <laughs> up in the Northern corner of the state. Go ahead, Shannon. So one thing that I know has really helped in our district is establishing safety committees, which particularly include the admin, include people like the PT who understand the mobility issue, but um, also include EAs and classroom teachers. Um, this has particularly been helpful in the case of our um, public separate schools within our, our district, um, where it is all students with complex needs, including mobility communication. Um, and, and we do things like this, where we, we throw out our last earthquake drill, our last fire drill, and we talk about what went wrong. <laughs> and, and it, it promoted some change within the, um, within the school, we realized one student suffers from PTSD connected to emergency personnel. And so, now we, if a student is having a medical emergency, we have to call a code black on the radio. So we know that that student has to be separated from the emergency personnel because he will actively attempt to intervene <laughs> with the medical care on a child versus um, seeing somebody in uniform that's scaring him. So I feel like if there's any way possible, like having those monthly team meetings where you're bringing people together to discuss the repercussions of your practices um, has really helped like bring these issues to light. You're seeing that, oh shoot, we couldn't get that, that mobility chair open. Like it was in, it was in the right wing and somebody knew to grab it, but nobody knew how to get the kid into it. And so then you have these active conversations as a team. And so Gosh, I'm thinking of if you had somebody in that situation, other than advanced training, what you could you do? I know at that point, somebody isn't going to have time to take out their phone and, and click the QR code for a video, <laughs> but maybe, I don't know. Um, so when you think about that, how do you go beyond? So thank you for that suggestion, because I think most of our uh, schools, our districts, our folks probably do have safety committees, and you are the ones who need to be saying, hey, <laughs> this needs to be at the table. So thank you for saying that. It does need to be a team. We know that. 
And so right now we've got about eight minutes left. And I think we've had enough discussion that we could probably all say this is what is important, but just really mm -hmm. looking at um, this student and it, not a student, you probably all know somebody like this who is in a self-contained classroom. Hopefully, uh, you know, there's some inclusion going on uh, for students with emotional disturbance and, and he has schizophrenia. I mean, he's just got all of these behavior issues underneath with, uh, you know, bad memories that bring back, as you said, PTSD. Um, he is probably going to be the one of those that you mentioned that needs to be separated from others if he's going to become violent in these situations. Uh, but here, um, he just, uh, he was inappropriate, being loud, okay? So as we think of it, what if you have this student, what are some of the strategies? What are some of the things that you could put down? And so I'm going to go ahead to our plan. And we're just in a few minutes we've got left, um, just looking at this document and just thinking with Eric in mind, who has all of these issues, not unlike what we're dealing with. Well, first, um, it's plans for Eric, wherever his school is. Uh, we know that uh, whatever the school year is, if you're starting in the fall, you may need to do another one of these because the schedule changes in the spring. You may want to put the student schedule on here and say and identify the um, exits or, or the safe spots in each one. But you have a case manager. Who are the contacts? And so this is an area that from our original version, a number of you really wanted it to say, post or, or past the, um, the beginning point. Does this student have, uh, is, are they able to follow procedures? This is really where our student, Eric, we're going to have to say no, because he, he doesn't have anything in his memory bank and he's inappropriate. And so then, I'm sorry. We also put a spot and we thought it was important to have a photo of the student. So that if somebody's trying to pick them out, um, they may say, oh, the kid in the wheelchair, but uh, maybe they're not uh, all easily identifiable. So this is a part that people really wanted to have. And again, it's at the top so people know when they've got a name. So the personnel who's responsible uh, for the coordination, the backup person, and this is in every one of the trainings, every piece. What happens if that person is gone? Does this mean that this kid is dispensable today? Heck, you know, you got to have plan B. If somebody is out sick, who's going to fill in? That's usually when uh, bad or uh, emergencies happen is when uh, everything is um, not as usual. How many adults does it need? If I've got somebody well with Eric, we know it's going to take at least two if he's got these behavior problems. Is he going to be need to need to be separated? Well, yes, two people who are not able to do anything with the rest of the group. Got to have that backup person. Okay, I'm sorry. Alternate uh, plan should the staff not be available. It's always talking about plan B because if you don't and you think everything is going to go smoothly, they, that doesn't happen in emergencies. So again, the method of communication with the family. Do they prefer a text? Do they prefer, and maybe they already get uh, the messages uh, that might go out as broadcast that there's something going on, but messages regarding their individual, is it something that you can program? Is it something uh, it just, well, it's certainly something you need to consider. What are the pre-activities? Obviously, we need to be talking about the plan. Does the student need an individual go bag? Um, and, I'm, uh, and so if it's yes, when was it assembled? I think that's if they don't need it, I think that's why we added that question. So with this student, what uh, needs to be in his go bag? We're probably, there may be some medication that needs to be in there. There may also be some, um, some strategies. He may have, uh, like I said, fidgets or whatever it is when you know the student, whatever it is. So um, emergency uh, medical, all of these things, medications, what about with an, uh, an oxygen tank? Is there somebody who's got an oxygen tank? Now, what are we going to do? And so this is a document that, if, um, that you certainly, we want to get your feedback. If you have a student who you are ready to use this with and uh, work with your team as a practice for this document, 
Well, you're going to need to do more practicing than that. You're going to use the document as a template and design it, modify it to meet your own needs, but also um, then letting us know if there was something on here that you go, oh my gosh, we were in the middle of something and, and we had never considered this. Let us know because we don't want this to be a 50 page document that's going to consider everything because nobody's going to read that in a time of emergency. But if there's something that we go, oh, how did we forget this? We now are in the point of being able to use this document, gathering feedback, fine tuning it. And oh, wouldn't it be great if everybody was using the same thing? That the, the document could travel with a student because it's no state system of capital. Hi, Devin. <laughs> I think you're unmuted, friend. You know, Deb, as long as Devin's unmuted, he had a comment in the chat about when to think about uh, peeps and practicing for peeps. Devin, do you want to talk about that comment? Sure. Um, I just stated that uh, at the beginning of the year, you're always thinking about this, but you're also very focused on training the IA in the classroom and you know going over how to transfer the student if they don't know and those types of things but a nice time to think about that whether it's at the end of September or usually um, more like the end of October when uh, the principal is getting ready to have their emergency drill of the month which usually they try and do in the last week, just before the end of the month. But that is a nice time to catch their attention. Um, if you can catch them at the end of September and say, hey, this is gonna be a concern. Uh, a lot of times they'll say, oh, well, let's plan that next month to practice. Um, this month, we're just gonna do it at a time when it's not a concern for this student. Um, you know, When they're already downstairs, something like that. Um, and then October, um, come back to them again and say, okay, now we need to plan it when they are upstairs and I have more availability of my time to be there at the school when that happens to coach them and, you know, go through what happens wrong or what needs to be um, more of an issue. Devin, I love that. And not only are you helping with the plan, but you're being an advocate to make sure the plan is it doesn't fall off the table and bringing it back around. And that's that's really what it takes. And in your role, yes, you are the one who's gathering the minds and the and putting the information down, but you are also the one. Um, and you don't have to take it all on your shoulders in the middle of the emergency if you are bringing everyone together to create a solid plan. If the custodian knows that in the emergency, that extra chair that he's got right there is meant for Gail and he's going to run to Gail. And I mean, if you've thought about these things and if you know your buildings right. and if you've got the, everyone comes together, that's the key. We so often do this in a vacuum. That's why people don't know whose role it is. The role is of the school to protect all of the students there. You are the ones who work most closely with our most complex kids. And so thank you all for uh, those of you who are on the PLT. Thank you for making an issue. Uh, I have made it a mission to keep this moving and keep it alive and hopefully to reach our vision of it having having it as a consideration in the IEP for all of our kids. And so um, I know we've just scratched the surface. You're going away thinking probably more questions than you have answers, but that's where we all start. We all start with um, what are the solutions? And so please come back to us and let us know how we can support you in this effort. And thank you for to the PLT and to Camille for uh, being always at the ready and leading focus groups. Appreciate that. Gail, any last comments for today or any last comments from anyone as we close on such an important topic? You know, I have a whole list of new things to think about um, as a result of this presentation and this conversation. So um, thank you all for your active participation. I know this is a huge um, issue and the plans for every different kind of emergency have to be a little bit different. Um, and that's been a real 
uh, topic of discussion as we've moved forward too. So that's all I have to say. Looks like you have something else you want to share, Deb. Um, I'm just going to, because obviously, as you're saying, we have um, we have topics that we could bring more. I've said maybe we need to have vendors, for instance. Uh, our, but we are planning our conference and additional professional development. And so the link that I put here, uh, we want to know, you know, I, again, I'm not a PT, but I want to make sure that our uh, your uh, needs for professional development, for your own vision and growth, and for your team, if you have topics, I really want to know. If you know somebody who presents on it, we really want to know. Um, it's it, the further we get from my office, the harder it is for me to know how to support you in the environment that you are in across our state. Please feel free to have an open line of communication with us as far as what those topics are and how we can help you in supporting those. Uh, thank you all so much for being here and for the hard work that you do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're not receiving our emails, or, uh, let me know. I'll be happy to get you on our list. If you uh, are registered for today, you will, as soon as we mark attendance, you will get an evaluation survey. Um, and as soon as you answer those few questions, your certificate will come to you. We are reading every survey response and we are taking it to heart. Know that we are listening. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for being here, everybody. We'll see you soon. Hugs to anybody who needs them. And stop the recording. <laughs>